Hello, my name is Mary L. Hackett, and today we're going to be working with a sewing machine technique that I use to make pictorial landscape quilts. I call it Naked Trees, and it is an, a machine applique technique. You can use it for making garments, wall hangs, pillow tops, anything that your heart desires. Right here I have a vest that I made using this technique, and I'm wearing a vest using this technique. I also use it in lots of landscape quilts. Now remember, a naked tree is a deciduous tree, one that has lost its leaves. These are some of the examples, some of the things that I have done with it. Now, believe it or not, no matter how complicated this may look or how detailed, everyone who sews can learn how to do this. All you need to do is have a sewing machine, a regular sewing machine. These are the materials that you would need to have. Light sky colors. Blue is nice for our first one and I would recommend that you get light blue fabric so we'll have high contrast. You'll need black fabric, solid black fabric. You'll need a light batting. I prefer a cotton batting, 100% cotton, and this is usually what they look like. They may be needle punched, which is the, the uh, little bumps you see on there. It has to be a firm cotton batting. This one is regular cotton. It's been glazed on both sides. You will also need a small amount of nylon tulle. You can get what is called uh, netting, if you like, it has the larger holes. This is what I prefer. It's sometimes called bridal tool. It's very inexpensive, so just buy a good amount of that. For all of these that we talked about, this is polyester batting, which I would not recommend for this particular technique because it tends to slip between the fabric layers. So if you already have some of this on hand, this will be your way to experiment instead with cotton. I think you will like cotton. If you want a backing on this, which is not necessary and certainly not until later, a firm fabric is the kind to use. And I like to use scraps of upholstery fabric because it is nice and firm. And we're going to be doing a lot of sewing. So the fabric tends to shrink up. And in order to combat that, we want a good firm batting and a good firm backing. These are the tools that you'll need to use. First of all, on your regular sewing machine, you will have to look in the manual and learn how to drop the feed dog or to cover the feed dog, whichever your machine does. Then you will need to look for what they may call a darning needle or an open toe uh, embroidery needle, uh, 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 embroidery foot, I'm sorry. See, this one has a spring and your machine will have one that's particularly for embroidery, free motion embroidery or for darning. If you can't find a particular one for your machine or you have an old machine, you can get one of these. This is a spring needle. When the needle goes down into the fabric, the spring holds the fabric just for a short amount of time as the needle goes in and the spring works as it comes up. That will work for this technique. In addition to these things, you will want to have some large safety pins for basting. You may like to have a stiletto. 
which is good for pushing the fabric under the needle. I just use a little eraser to protect myself from that point. But if you don't want to invest in that, here is a very old seam ripper that I have been using for years for the same thing. Uh, one of these little things works. It doesn't matter. You will need a seam ripper that really works because you may be tearing some stitches out from time to time. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I'll describe that to you later. You will need some small scissors of some kind. I prefer embroidery scissors that are very small. Any sharp, nice small scissors will do. If you want to really treat yourself, this is the best kind of scissor to have. It's called a duckbill applique scissor because this large blade prevents you from cutting into the fabric below as you cut away your applique. It would be nice to have some very fine tweezers. And you will need a fine Sharpie black marker. Doesn't have to be this brand, but it does have to be permanent. It has to be ultra fine, and it has to be black. Then to mark on your black fabric, you will need a light marker of some kind. This is a yellow chalk. This is a chalk type marker. You could use yellow, white, or silver chalk pencils. But my favorite thing to use is something free and from the bathroom. Just a sliver of soap. It's perfect for marking on black fabric. It irons away. It won't harm a thing. Be sure when you're getting your things together to bring lots of cotton thread. I use Mettler 100% cotton, but any good brand of cotton or cotton covered polyester will do. And you'll want to fill lots of bobbins. So you'll be ready to really go at it when you start sewing that tree. Now, in order to do this well and really enjoy it, you should do some practice. And the way to do that is to make yourself a practice sandwich at home with um, muslin or any kind of fabric in the backing, some of that cotton batting that I've been telling you about in the center of your sandwich, and solid black fabric on top. Make yourself just a little sandwich of that and practice free motion sewing. That way you can really enjoy yourself when we get going. When you start to put your fabrics together for your tree, this is what you will need. Backing, uh, the batting on, on uh, the back side. We really won't need batting, backing fabric this time. I'm sorry, backing fabric. This is the sky fabric that I have chosen, a light blue. And again, solid black. Pin this in several places and we'll be ready to go for the next lesson. Between now and then, I'd like it very much if you will become familiar with your machine, make sure that it's clean, well oiled, has a fresh needle, and don't forget you need a darning or embroidery foot and you, learn, you need to learn how to drop the feed dog on your machine and practice, practice, practice just free motion sewing. See you next time. Hello, today we're going to be sewing trees. I will show you the method that I use for designing these trees as I go, and you can decide later whether you want to design your own in this way or whether you want to use some other method that I will also show you. Now, first I will show you on a dry erase board exactly how I would do the tree on fabric. As we know, trees are slightly wider at the bottom then at the top, I'm speaking of the trunk. So I start where the tree starts, at the earth. With a slight curve, I go up, and just deciding wherever I want the first branch, I go out. Then I come back in and decide where I want a branch. This first time around, we just want 
simple branches. We'll add the complex details later. I come back into the tree where the, where the trunk is. I go up and go off in another direction, adding some branches there. I go back to the trunk and go up and do it again. And it is so simple that you may find you really like this part. Don't be afraid of whether you've ever drawn before or not because all you have to do is look out a window to see what a tree looks like. You can make it a split trunk, as I often do. You can make it a straight trunk. You can make it a tree that you know what the shape of it looks like because maybe it's in your yard. Or you can make it just a generic tree. You make it as simple or as complicated as you like, but remember about the tapering. The trunk will be tapered as it goes up. It'll be larger as it goes down. And any errors we make along the way, I'll show you methods for taking care of it. That's the kind of tree we start with. It's as simple as that. Now let me show you other ways to do it and how we will put this tree on black fabric. One way you can do it is to visit my website, which is mariellhackett.com, and I will give you the link to find patterns. This pattern is for the Eastern Red Bud which is one of my favorite trees and it grows in my yard. When you print it off the web, it'll look like this, which is too small for us to use. You can set your computer so that it fills the full page and it will look like this. And when I learn more about technology, it won't have that gray background. I have done these myself though, and this is how it turns out when printed off on tracing paper or any lightweight paper. It would look like this. And then I put it on the sandwich that I have prepared, and I simply pin it to what I showed you before, the batting, the sky fabric, and the black fabric. I put the paper on top and simply sew around. I'm going to show you how to do that. And then, look, you can tear it away. No problem. This is one way that you can do it. Other ways is you can photograph trees yourself when it's the season for naked trees. I like to look for the shapes of trees in um, a field guide to trees. I like to draw them myself. You can even make a child's uh, drawing into one of these trees, or you can make a spooky tree for Halloween. I've done that. But this is how you can get it onto the black fabric this way. The way I normally do it, however, is just to take the sandwich that we've been talking about again, black fabric, and I'm going to take a piece of soap, my favorite marker, and again, I'm going to start at the bottom. And you notice I'm doing this upside down. So if I can do it upside down, you can do it right side up. You go either way to make branches. And remember, some trees have a downward branch. And I might decide that my trunk is going to go here. And perhaps I'm going to have some downward branches here and some upward ones here. And when you get used to this technique, you will find that all you really need is the bare outline of that tree. Then we're going to go to the sewing machine and I'm going to show you how to set it up for free motion sewing and how to sew this tree. Hello, here we are at the sewing machine. Remember we have a sandwich that we're going to sew on that has the black fabric on top, our sky fabric in the middle, and the batting on the bottom. This is the tree that I drew with soap. I want to remind you as you set up your sewing machine that the feed dog needs to be dropped so that you can sew in any direction. 
you need to have a darning needle, a, a darning foot, or um, a free motion foot on your machine as I do here. And you must remember while you're sewing to always have the presser foot dropped. I'm going to start at the bottom of the tree, just as I did with the drawing. And I'm going to sew up the trunk and out the first branch. If you have a needle down function on your machine, it's a good time to use it, but it's not really necessary. I'm using white thread this time because on the black fabric it'll show up much better for the camera. And if you want to do this at home for practice, white thread is fine. Just remember you'll have to do it over for your sample black on black in order to get the effect that we're looking for. Now as I sew, remember that the size of the stitches is controlled by the combination of how hard I push on the presser uh, pedal and how fast I move the fabric. Now here I have my tension much too high so I'm lowering it and I'm sewing out the first branch, lowering it some more, and right back down where I came from on the same line to get back to the branch because we want this to be a very fine branch. Then I continue on out the branch that I drew. We don't have to stay exactly on the line. My machine is doing something. on the line that I drew we have to stay exactly on the line as you sew back along the branch errors will be made don't worry about it every time you go off in a new direction try to remember to sew back to the branch right along the same line until you start back to the trunk then you will want to add a little width to the branch. I hope you can see with the white on the white what I'm doing. I'm not exactly following my drawing, but something close to it. And I go up and out with every branch, allowing the trunk to become a little slimmer each time I go. Now every time you start and stop with this technique, it's really easy because you don't need to tie off. You're making tiny stitches. You can start and stop whenever and wherever you want to. And in the finished tree, it won't even show. For your assignment for next time, I want you to make your sandwich like this, sew the way I'm doing here, and make one turn around your tree, sewing only the largest branches and the trunk, and trying to make sure that all of this is tapered and somewhat natural looking. But since this is your first attempt, Remember that what's most important is practice, practice, practice. I will show you here what happens if you forget to drop the presser bar before you sew. This little nest of thread goes on and it all locks up and it may even end up with a broken needle. That's not fun. On this sandwich where I sewed with black thread, it's hard to see, and you may have difficulty seeing. 
If you have a hard time seeing where you have sewn, you can just skim over with my good old soap and you'll be able to see at your own sewing machine where you've been. That's all your assignment is for this time. Next time we're going to cut away around the tree. And if you can't stand the suspense as to what it is we're doing, take a look at this to see the beginning of what your tree will look like. Next time we will cut away around the tree and we will show you details for making this tree look ever more realistic. Have fun with it. Hello, in this segment, you're really going to begin to see the results of your hard work. You're going to see the illusion that is set up with this kind of sewing to begin to see a very realistic looking tree. We're going to take the tree that you have sewn around. I hope that you have sewn with black thread and made a tapered trunk and some basic limbs to the tree and set out what the shape of the tree will be. Now we're going to go into the detail work. Using my duckbill scissors, I'm going to insert the blade between the black fabric and the sky fabric. And cutting as closely as I can to my stitching without cutting the thread, I'm moving up the right hand side of the tree because I'm right handed. If you are left-handed, you would probably want to go up the other side, but this doesn't matter a bit. When I get to the end, the first branch, I'm going to turn around and cut the other way. I will save all of the scraps from what I'm cutting away. We may need those later. I go in at the tip and cut as far as I can with these scissors. I go in another place, wherever the duckbill will fit, and cut again. I can also go all around the outer edge of the tree and cut away what I did not sew down and come back. With smaller scissors, I will then cut into the area between the branches. As I said, we are carefully cutting close to the thread and it begins to look like this. It's a little time consuming to go all around the tree, but it can be very much fun because you're unveiling the work that you have done. Once you have cut away all of the black, your tree will look something like this, I hope. And I will show you how I do the embroidery that makes this tree come alive. You may notice that we're also doing quilting at the same time. With this process, the entire thing gets done in one sewing operation. Now remember I said the thread does not need to be tied off, so I simply drop my needle somewhere along a branch. I'm going to free motion sew with tiny stitches into the light blue and get a very high contrast twig started. Now watch as I sew, remembering that just beginning, you will probably sew much slower than this, but after you get used to it, you can get up some speed because it's very much like mm, drawing with pen and ink. The only thing that's different is that you would be moving the paper instead of the pen. And just as I did with sewing the original tree, I am moving up and away from the trunk at all times. 
when I get to the end of a branch, if it's rather blunt, I'm going to use my little scissors to cut as closely as I can to make as pointed a little branch as I can. And if I can't get it very pointed, I will show you how I'm going to sculpt it with embroidery by going back and forth near the end to make it slimmer and then continuing on out with more embroidery stitches to make a twig. You can quickly see how realistic this can look with some practice. Now you see why I said that practice is very important because the effect is really worth the effort. <laughs> that needs five minutes. <laughs> uh, okay, can I start again with an okay. Really worth the effort. Really worth the effort. is really worth the effort. One. Is really worth the effort. Let me show you a little tip for getting rid of little threads with all the cutting away you've done. I simply take wide masking tape make it into a ring and use that to pick up little bits of thread off the surface. If the black that you have been using frays when you cut it, think of this as being something that contributes to the illusion of reality on your tree, to the roughness, to what a tree actually looks like. Now I'm going to show you what to do if, as in this case here, I have an area that is pretty fat and I didn't taper my trunk very well. There are ways to take care of these things without having to worry about it. Here's a branch that is obviously too fat in some places. I take my trusty bar of soap and I'm going to mark where I should have made it instead of where I did. This area I will now sew with black thread and then take my uh, seam ripper, rip out that seam, cut away this here, and I will have the branch slim as it should have been. The opposite is true if I have made an error by making something too narrow. Here I have a branch that is way too skinny in here. And I want it to be as large as the rest of it and taper down naturally. So what I do is simply take one of those scraps that I told you not to throw away, pin it in place, again with my soap, redraw where I would want it to be instead of where it was. I will then sew with black along that line and along the edge of my scrap 
and cut the new sewing, the, the scrap from the new sewing away. And there I have fixed whatever was happening there. I don't have to worry about what it looks like because this tree is so stunning when it's finished that no one will even notice the difference. Next time we're going to learn how to make even more complicated twigs for this tree, how to make it look even more realistic. Uh, in the future we'll be learning what to do with this tree. I hope you're having fun with these techniques. I want you to go ahead and finish the tree that you have cut off by adding twigs, as much embroidery as you would like or as little. Hello. In this segment we're going to learn how to put even more delicious details onto your tree. I hope since we've been making trees that you've been paying more attention to what they look like in nature and notice some things about tapering trunks, multiple trunks, uh, crooked trunks, branches that go up rather than down, various species of trees. I'm going to show you what uh, a river birch tree in my neighbor's yard looks like, more or less, and we can talk about what things we can do to make our tree look more natural, whatever species it is. On the dry erase board here, I have the river birch, which its trunk divides near the bottom. Have you ever noticed that about river birch trees? And their branches tend to hang over. Well, in the tree that you've been doing, I asked you not to cross over the branches, or at least I indicated that, because we were making the basis of our tree. Now we're going to learn how, for more realism, you can make branches that go over other parts of the tree if you want to. And we're going to go to the machine where I can show that to you. I would like you to look at the tree that you have quilted and embroidered, cut out, and you have added twigs, which this tree does not yet have. But it's simpler for me to show you how to add an extra branch. As you look at your tree, see if there is some place that might benefit from an extra branch that falls over other branches. Perhaps a, a downward uh, leaning branch or a branch that is not out far enough, some place where you want to add another branch. This is the technique for how I do that. I take one of the scraps that we saved and I'm going to pin it in place on the tree trunk and then I'm going to take my trusty soap and simply draw the impression of a new branch. It doesn't have to be anything fancy. And as we now know, I may not follow that line exactly, but I'm indicating to myself where the trunk is and about where I want the branch to go. In the same way that we have been doing it, I put my needle down into the fabric I'm going to take my pin away so that I don't run over it. And now I'm going to sew at the base of the branch and out the branch, just as I did with the original sewing of the tree. Out the branch again. and back again. To the trunk. And I'm going to end off. Now, I take my scissors. After I've cut the threads away, I'm going to treat this branch the same as I did the original tree itself and I cut away the scraps. And see what I have. I rather like the mystery of this. That is to say, I never know for sure what it's going to look like, but to me that adds to the fun of it and the organic nature of your tree. 
because just as the tree grows the way it will and the wind blows where it wants to go, sometimes the fabric and the stitches go where they want to go. And I think it certainly adds to the whole thing. Almost finished. I can snip off the little bit at the trunk. And if I were working at home, I would take more time to clean that up, just as you did with the original tree. And now I have a branch that lays over other branches. Notice how just in that one area already, it's looking a little more complex and more tree-like. You can add branches like that anywhere you want to, to add to the complexity of it. You can do this whether you've done the embroidery already with twigs or not. Branches can be added at any time during the sewing. This is such detail work that the impression, the silhouette is the important part, not the detail of it. People will never notice the details of it until they come close and they'll never think of them as errors. I want to show you now how I take nylon tool, which I asked you to get before, and how I can use it to up the ante, one might say, on the details of this tree. Here is the netting. I simply took my scissors and cut out any way I felt like to make a shape that would add to the end of the branch and I continued to do the embroidery stitches sewing out to the end. Here in this area I used the bridle tool which is softer and grayer and it gives a different impression. I take these small pieces I do not usually mix two kinds of tool in one tree but that would be up to you. I choose one or the other lay it over usually the ends of a branch, sometimes closer into the trunk, and I may have several of these around the tree. I continue to embroider, make the twigs, and that, all of that holds the tool down, and it adds to the complexity beautifully. Now I'll show you an example of a finished tree and how I decided where to put the various amounts of tool. I used the bridle tool in this case. There are some open areas of the tree. There are some where I have overlapped the tool. And this is because I have observed the density of trees, what they really look like, and my goal is to make enough of an illusion that the viewer doesn't question it. They simply look at it and think tree. As you get better at this, and as you observe trees more, you will also do the same sort of thing. For next time, I would like you to use bridal veil and netting to experiment with your tree, to see what effects you like, to add ever more detail to your tree. And next time, we'll learn more about what we can do with the tree that we're making. I hope you're having fun with this. Hello, this time we're going to further embellish your tree with an environment. Let's take a piece of upholstery fabric or some other uh, firm fabric and put it face down on your work table. Then we'll take the tree that you've been working on and lay it centered on top. This should be, the fabric that you're putting it on should be somewhat larger than the total tree itself up to two inches larger if you want to. Then you'll need some batting to fill in below the trunk here. And I have simply cut the batting that more or less matches up with the batting on the tree and pinned it into place. Now, if I want this tree to be growing out of something, we're going to have to put some land below it. And I like to make something that is somewhat uneven, not straight as a table. There are a couple of ways that you can do this, and both ways are very simple. If your machine is still set up for free motion sewing, 
you should now set it up with a walking foot if you have it, but if you don't, at least engage the feed dog and begin to uh, think of sewing straight lines again because the simplest way to do this is to lay it on top as I have shown you here and sew with black thread anywhere along here that you want to so that it's uneven and then cut away just as you did with a tree close to the edge. You'll have a nice raw edge which is about all you would see if you're seeing the silhouette of the tree like this. The other way you can do it is to put it right sides together and sew a seam here and turn it back and that will give you a smoother edge if that appeals to you more. Now we get to the quilting of this piece which is really easy and totally unnecessary unless like me you want to have it completely finished in a way that uh, implies sky behind the tree and a certain time of day that sort of thing. With this sandwich made below the tree and while you still have black thread in your machine you can sew a few wavy lines in the land area no more than say three in the amount of space that I have here with black thread and that will be your quilting of that part. If you have pins below don't forget to take them out before you do the quilting stitches. Then I'm going to take you to the sewing machine and show how I quilt the sky around and above the tree. I've chosen to use a variegated orange rayon thread that has a certain glimmer to it. And I'm simply going to start on one side and sew through all layers and make it mm, a little bit of a wavy line to imply perhaps sky and movement of air. Now, what happens when I get to the tree? Won't those stitches show over the tree? And what do I do about that? Well, let's find out. I'm going to start down here where the tree is and I'm going to sew another wavy line. You see it has gone all the way through to the back and here because it's variegated these stitches show up very light. What am I going to do about that? There's a shadow here. See the shadow? Does that? Here's where I come in with pen work. This is the Sharpie permanent pen and any area where a light thread goes over the dark tree, all I have to do is touch it with the end of the pen and it disappears. And yet, I hope you can see this well enough to understand that the stitches that are to be behind the tree continue to look as if they're behind the tree. And almost like magic, we have contributed to our illusion of a tree silhouette in the simplest of ways. Compare the effect in the center of the tree here with the area where I have not used the pen. You're going to use the pen anywhere the thread crosses the tree and will show up. And you can do that with subsequent quilting lines continuing on down the tree. Now, what will happen when I get to the trunk? If I had a lot of stitches continuing horizontally over a vertical trunk, this would be a problem. So I'll show you how I handle that. I'm going to make my quilting stitches through the sky
I'm going to stop at the trunk. I raise my needle and my presser foot and I pull so that I have a few inches of thread here. Then I go back to the place on the trunk where the line would have continued and now I go on across. When I'm finished, I'll show you how I take care of this thread. I'm going to cut it in half on the surface. Then I will turn it over, take my bobbin thread, and cut it in half. And then I simply take the thread from the surface, and I am going to tie these two into a knot and bury the knot in the back of the quilt, just as I would do if I were hand quilting or machine quilting. And on the surface, we can see that now nothing shows at the trunk. It simply looks as if the tree is in front of the sky, which is exactly where we want it to be. For next time, I would like you to add earth to the underside, the, the bottom of your tree. I would like you to quilt the sky behind the tree and practice using a pen and see what you think about pen work in quilting. In the last segment, we're going to learn things about what to do with these trees, how to bind or frame them, and how to use them. Hello. Your quilt is finished. It's embroidered, appliqued, and quilted all in one operation. I hope you're pleased with your results, but if not, the fix for that is to do it again and again and again and practice until you get it the way you like it. I'm going to show you today how you can uh, document your quilt, how you can display your quilt, and some things about preservation. At the machine here, I'm going to show you how I sign my quilts. Now, it's black on orange so that you can see it. Many times I will uh, sign them tone on tone, however. I might use gray thread to sew into the black land section here, or I might use orange thread in the sky. This time it's going to be black on orange, and you do it the same way you did with all of the sewing on the machine. The only thing that's different is you practice moving the fabric just the way you would move the pen if you were signing your name. You don't need anything fancy on a sewing machine with a computer alphabet or anything like that. You simply need to sew your name the way you write your name. As simple as can be. I will go back later and I will cut out the threads that connect the pieces, the, the words together, and it will show up. Now I'm going to go to the table and show you how to finish off this piece and some of the other techniques for displaying. Lay your piece on a flat surface, and if you haven't already done so, you want to block it. And what this means is you're going to uh, spray water onto it and pin it onto either a soft planning board or the top of an ironing board works well. You're going to pin it firmly and simply let it dry from the wet state. I use a plastic spray bottle to spray it all over. I smooth it out and then I use pins to hold it in place. This one has already been blocked so that it lies flat and you can see how the quilting lines that I put in the sky help to distribute quilting throughout the entire piece so that we don't have any bubbles going on, a lot of waving around. Uh, you can see how I have used tool to add some density and detail to some of the tree. You can see how I have left some open areas where you can see the sky completely through the branches, which is exactly what happens with natural trees. 
I have added some uh, land mass underneath, as I showed you before, and I have started to sign my name over here. Now, I want to tell you about documentation because letting people know who made this quilt and when can be very important. For all the quilts that I make, I add, in addition to signing on the front, some sort of label that gives information. In this case, the name of the quilt, my address, contact information. I added another little label because this piece was in my book, A Bridge to Landscape Quilts, and I wanted to document that. The future people of the world will be so amazed with your uh, hand-sewn naked trees that they'll want to know who made it and under what circumstances. It's up to you exactly how much information you put with this quilt, certainly on a label, uh, but at least please sign your name and put the date on. We'll all appreciate it in the future. Now how about saving your quilt from being harmed? One of the things that happens to a lot of quilts, except, except especially <laughs> those quilts that are hung on the wall like a picture in a living room with the drapes open, that sort of thing, over time will fade. And we don't want that to happen. A quilt with vibrant color like this, we really want it to last many years. So I use one of these types of products which are designed to uh, protect the quilt. Not only does it give it uh, protection from UV uh, light rays, but it also helps uh, dirt to stay off the surface. It, water will even bead up on it. I use three light coats of one of these uh, spray products and uh, let it dry thoroughly in between. It doesn't really change the hand of the fabric, but remember, this is not a quilt that a baby is going to be chewing on. And this is not a quilt that's going to be laundered regularly. This is a quilt that you want to hang on your wall and enjoy. Whether it's a garment or whether it is a wall hanging, it's something that will not be washed very often. This sort of thing really helps. Now, how do you display your quilt? One way to do it is with binding. And many of you know that in order to bind a bed quilt, we may use straight of the grain, strips of fabric or bias strips, which is springy like this. It doesn't matter which you use, but the way to prepare it is to cut strips that are longer than each side of the quilt, to fold the strips in half, wrong side together, if there is a wrong side, line it up against your edges, sew through all layers, and then turn this to the back. But what would happen if it's wobbly, or as, we, as I mentioned, blocking it is important, so also is squaring it up. This quilt has been squared up. It doesn't matter what size or shape it may be. It can be horizontal or vertical. I might decide that I didn't want this whole background on and I could cut it off with a rotary cutter. But the main thing is that it is straight to the edge when you're finished with it then binding if you want, and if you don't want binding, such as this quilt has, this is binding to match the border, you may want to simply have it framed, and the way to do that is to take it to a professional framer. I highly recommend a professional framer. Unless you're pretty good at this and you've done it for years, then you can give it a try. In that case, it doesn't matter whether you bind the edges or not. If they will be inside the frame and the batting and the, and the matting, I'm sorry, then the raw edge will not matter. However, another way to do it is to go ahead and bind it like this and then have the whole thing mounted on mat board behind a frame or not behind a frame. Now, this is concluded with uh, everything I know about how to make these trees. Here's an idea for uh, setting the contrast on its head by putting white against the dark. Of course, this doesn't happen in nature, but it certainly is graphic and beautiful to look at. I did one using uh, white trees to imply a full moon. Have you ever noticed a full moon and the shadows that fall? It seems that things glow. You could make a fantasy tree like this. There's so much that you can do with this. I hope you will enjoy it. And if you would like to know more about landscape quilting in general, this is my book, 
A Bridge to Landscape Quilts, published by AQS, and the details about how to do these trees and many more things that will really help punch up your landscape quilts so that they look ever more realistic will be in my next book. Thank you very much.